welcome everybody to the uh, third session of uh, Remit webinars in 2023. Uh, my name is Masoud Alame, and I'm today host for you this uh, session of webinar. I'm a junior researcher in the project, in the Remit at RE project, and I work uh, at IMIC in Belgium. So today, uh, yeah, I will start with a short uh, introduction on the objective of the Remit webinars. So in these uh, webinars, we are uh, we want to introduce uh, material characterization techniques and present example of research, aiming to teach and inspire future users of the platform. So we'll have speakers from different research infrastructures each month, targeting the last Friday of the month, uh, depending on the availability of the speakers, of course, and the accommodating the public holidays. Uh, and today is the third session of the Remit webinars in 2023 with the title Neutrons and Nanometers. Our speaker, Dr. Sarah Roger, is from uh, ISIS Neutron and Mion uh, Source in UK. So I will briefly introduce her. So Sarah is the head of uh, uh, Material and Engineering Division and ISIS. She has been facility scientist on a small hangar beam line uh, since August 2006. First year junior uh, beamline scientist on I-22 at Diamond Light Source, and later joining ISIS as a member of uh, the SONS team in February 2008. While listed at ISIS, she, uh, she has been the instrument scientist on LOQ, the instrument responsible on SONS 2D, and finally the SONS group leader before she moved to her current role. Uh, before arriving at Diamond, she was at the University of Bristol in the uh, School of Chemistry, where she was undertaking EPSRC founded PDRA position in the lab of Professor Julian Isto, studying the formation of gold nanoparticles in supercritical carbon dioxide. Uh, prior to this, uh, she completed her PhD in the same lab in 2005. Sarah has uh, Sarah also obtained her Master of Science in Chemistry from the University of Bristol in 2002. Uh, she's an active research. She has active research in the program in uh, uh, research program in the uh, in the areas of surfactant, colloid uh, chemistry, nanoparticle synthesis, ionic liquids, and supercritical carbon dioxide, and is currently co-investigator on several grants in these areas. Sarah is named author on over 175 scientific publications and currently has an H index of 32. So before uh, giving the floor to Sara, I just want to um, ask uh, all the attendants that you can um, ask your question, type them in the Q&A box. And after the presentation, uh, I will ask the, your question from the speaker. So by this, I want to welcome Sara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just share my screen. Hope that's working. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So my name is uh, yeah Dr. Sarah Rogers, and I've been at ISIS for a considerable amount of time. And before that, I was uh, at the synchrotron also just across the way at Diamond. So I've been doing uh, small angle scattering since my PhD. Uh, fell in love with it for the first uh, experiment that I went on. And so today I'm going to sort of give you an introduction to uh, neutron scattering, why we think it's cool, uh, small angle neutron scattering specifically. And then uh, an overview of the, of the science that we can do. I will say that from my background being in soft matter, a lot of the examples I will give are kind of, of the soft matter um, ilk side, but there's clearly other stuff outside that to do with physics, skirmions, flux sign lattices, engineering. Uh, that's just not my, my particular uh, theme of science. But the, the, yeah, contact us if you're interested. We've, we've got plenty of people that can help you in all those different areas. So, um, I always like to start my talks by saying thank you. Uh, these bits of work are never a solo expedition. You, you need to collaborate with a lot of cool people. Uh, and this is just some of the people that I've been very lucky to work with over the last sort of 15 to 20 years. So you can see they're arranged from uh, different universities. So we've got Bristol, where I did my PhD with Julian Easto, Cambridge, but also a lot of industrial um, collaborators. So Rolls-Royce, uh, Croda, for example, uh, Lubrizol, Axanovel, Infinium. We work with a lot of companies as well, uh, and without their collaborations, none of this would be possible. 
Uh, just a very super brief outline. I'll be telling you why we use neutrons and how. Uh, ISIS is slightly different from, from reactor sources, for example. I'll give you a brief introduction to what SANS and also Spin Echo SANS is. Both those techniques are used in, in the SANS group. Who you can contact if you're interested in, in those techniques, how we do it, uh, what, what it is, what, what you gain from those measurements, and, and some science examples, and where we think we're going in the future. But of course, I don't have a crystal ball, so it's always difficult to know for sure where we're going. So neutrons, I'm sure you're probably aware, we do inelastic scattering to probe dynamical behavior, so to look at how atoms and molecules move. Uh, and then we do scattering in reciprocal space, and that gives us information about structure, which we convert then to, to real space structure. And that's the side of things I'll be talking about today, so more about structure rather than dynamics. And why do we think neutrons are cool? Well, we like neutrons because they're highly penetrating, they have a magnetic moment, they're a weak probe, and they have a very specific energy and wavelength that we happen to use here at ISIS. They have a very specific type of cross section and you can play tricks with HD contrast. But what does that actually mean? So that means we can actually look at bulk properties of a material. We can look deep inside matter without having to chop open an airplane wing, or it means we can have um, lots of different sample environment with chunky windows, as long as they're designed, designed out of the right materials. It means we can really do a lot of in situ measurements. You can look at magnetic structures. Uh, it's non-destructive. So if you have very delicate samples, such as for biology, you can guarantee that the sample is probably the same at the end of the measurement as it was beforehand. Sometimes with x-rays, you can get damage to the sample because of heating. We don't suffer from that. The energies that we use happen to be such that we can probe atomic and molecular length scales. The neutron contrast, contrast or cross-section, sorry, allows us to see light elements like carbon and hydrogen. And this contrast trick we can play with hydrogen and deuterium, for example, allows us to hide or highlight specific parts of the molecules that we're interested in or, or multi-component systems, in fact. So to go a little bit more into this neutron cross-section, I'm sure you're probably aware that it's very different to what you get from X-rays. So X-rays is the top, the red line here, where the, the light elements, you hardly get any scattering. The heavier the element, the more the interaction with the X-ray. I think everyone's very used to the classical image, X-ray image of a hand, where sort of the squidgy hydrocarbon parts of the hand are invisible, the skin, the flesh, the muscle. But the, the heavy elements, the, the bone, the, the calcium and the jewellery, they, they interact very strongly with the x-rays. For neutrons, the interaction with, mat, uh, with the cross-section is totally different. And it's totally random, in fact. Uh, and you'll see from the, the blue blobs there that the interaction with, with light elements is actually quite strong, so hydrogen and carbon. And the, the classical image there you'll see of an, a neutron image is that of a, a rose in the lead casket. And in fact, the lead is pretty much transparent to the neutrons. They whistle straight through. But the rose, which contains sort of carbon, hydrogen, water, it interacts with the, with, the, um, with the neutrons very strongly. So actually, hopefully you can see that they're actually very complementary techniques. If you use both together, you get a very clear picture or a very detailed picture of what's going on in your samples. The trick I talked about with hydrogen and deuterium, this is a, we typically talk about that because it's, it, I'm a soft matter person. So often swapping in heavy water or deuterating a hydrocarbon material is, is the easiest contrast to change. But again, the, the, the interaction of, um, you can swap the isotopes over for hydrogen and swap it for deuterium and you can see the interaction changes totally. So this very strong interaction you have with hydrogen goes away when you have deuterium. And so then it allows us to play these tricks with uh, isotopic substitution where you can hide and highlight different parts of the, the system that you're interested in. So the, the sort of the, the blobs I have on the right hand of the screen there um, shows you where if you have like a nanoparticle stabilized by surfactant, if you had everything uh, sort of hydrocarbon but deuterated the surfactants, you can just see the surfactant shell. If you have everything deuterated but then in a hydrocarbon solvent or the, vice, the opposite of that, you can see the whole structure or you can just look at the core. So basically you can get a shell, the whole structure and the core all together. And if you fit that simultaneously, it gives you a very detailed picture of, of a complex system. And the same can be played if you're doing it at surfaces where well. you can hide the surface. So you can just look at the molecules at a surface, for example. So it can be a very powerful technique for looking for multi-component um, systems, which we often have in colloid science, for example. So why do I think ISIS is particularly cool? Uh, I don't know if you know that ISIS is a spallation source, so we're not a reactor source. And basically what that means, I won't go into the full um, description of how we make neutrons. You can find that on the ISIS webpage if you're particularly interested. We basically take a beam of high energy protons and smash that into a heavy metal target. 
Uh, in our case, that heavy metal target is tungsten clad with tantalum. And when you do that, you basically smash neutrons out of it. And that's the spallation process. And for every proton that goes in, we get about 15 to 20 protons, uh, sorry, neutrons. That smashing process at ISIS happens 50 times a second. Uh, so it, it, it is quite a, a, a number of neutrons that we produce. And what that allows us to do, obviously those neutrons come off at all sorts of crazy energies. Uh, we slow them down with things called moderators that slow the neutrons down to an energy or wavelength range that's actually usable. We have different moderators on different parts of the target system, depending on the speed or the, the wavelength that you're interested in. So for example, excitations will warmer neutrons than the large scale structures people, sands and reflectivity really like the cold neutrons. So we have a range of moderators that slow them down. But what that means is we still get a white beam. So even on a, on a specific instrument, you don't get one wavelength, you get multiple wavelengths in one shot. And that allows us to use a technique called time of flight. Uh, and so basically we can, we know the distance from the, the source to the sample. It allows us to then, we know uh, the velocity of those neutrons. We can calculate the wavelength or the energy that you're interested in. And basically you're getting multiple wavelengths in one shot or multiple energies. So it allows us to cover a very big Q space without having to move parts of the instrument, such as the detector. So we don't have to vary uh, theta, which is a scattering angle. We let the neutrons do the work and we scatter, uh, so we vary um, theta, sorry, wavelength, not theta, we, we, we do wavelength. So it allows you to probe, say if you're doing something kinetic, we can do it in one measurement. Whereas if you're at a reactor and you wanted to measure several uh, different Q, Q ranges, you'd have to move the detectors. You'd have to do the measurement more than once. So it can be quite powerful for that. Um, the SANS group at ISIS is changed slightly. So since I made these slides, I've been promoted to be uh, a division head. So now Rob Dalgleish, who is the chap in the red jumper, is now the new group leader. And we're going to have to backfill um, his role to ensure that we have enough people covering the instruments. But basically, we have about there's nine of us in the group and we cover a range of science because the science that you do at, at science is very varied. So you have uh, Rob, who is the guy in the red, Diego uh, and Dirk, who are very interested in magnetic systems. So if you're interested in magnetic sands or polarized sands, they're the guys to talk to. And um, we have myself and Steve, who are very, and, and Greg at the bottom, who are very interested in sort of colloid science, surfactant science, polymers, that end of things. Uh, James and Najet are very interested in biological systems. So if you wanted to do anything to do with biology, those are the two people I would suggest that you talk to. And uh, Leiji in the middle is more interested in sort of um, multi-scale systems. So she does uh, work across not just sands, but also uh, on, on diffraction as well. So she's interested in multi-scale sort of clays, that kind of thing. Um, Rob and Greg are also the two people that I would talk to if you want to do spin echo sounds. Um, they work on the Llama instrument, which is which is our spin echo instrument. So um, basically, if you if you want to, if it's any science you can think of that you want to do with sounds, I can probably find you somebody to talk to. So just let me know, and I can put you in contact with the right person. At ISIS, we're very lucky. We have four sounds instruments. Uh, I won't go into the details because, again, if you want to know something specific, I suggest that you contact me uh, after this or at a later date or one of the team. But they're all very complementary. So low Q was the first instrument we had built on target one. It's a static instrument. It covers one specific Q range, but can take a whole range of different sample environments. SANS 2D was the first instrument on our second target station. So at ISIS, we have two target stations. The second one was optimized, what we call large scale structures. And so, so stuff on the, the nanometer length scale target two was optimized for those sizes. So the moderators, the rep rate is all very much geared around the, the slower neutrons. And that was our first beamline built there. It, we learned a lot from what we'd found on low Q. So actually we played more tricks on Santity. Not only did we vary lambda, we can also vary theta by changing the detector distances. So we can, if you're interested in stuff that's very small, we can um, push the detectors closer so you get the flux back. If you're interested in stuff that's large for neutrons, then we can push the detectors far away. So we can basically tune the instrument to the size regime that you're interested in. Uh, Llama, we developed because it's a spin echo instrument. So it does standard sand, but also does the spin echo technique. And I'll tell you more about what that means later. And Zoom is our first po fully polarized um, sand instrument. So that's predominantly where we do the magnetic studies. So we have sort of four very complementary uh, machines that, that are available to our users, which is great. So a typical experiment, for those that don't know, we tend to measure everything on these big two-dimensional detectors. So the ones on San Sudi, for example, we have two times two, like one meter squared um, arrays, uh, about eight millimeter size pixels. 
and we take those 2D images, but often what we do is collapse those down. Uh, we radially leverage it, collapse it down into a 1D image where you basically get intensity versus Q or, or the size that you're interested in. Um, and then that intensity contains information on the size, the shape, and the interactions between the scattering centers within that sample. That scattering pattern is then normally modeled. So we have uh, analysis software that the instrument scientists can help you use that can then give you a picture or an idea of what's going on in your sample. And as I said before, we have this parameter that I keep going on about called Q. Uh, and Q is uh, equal to four pi sine theta, uh, theta over two over lambda, where theta is a scattering angle and lambda is the wavelength of the neutrons. So basically it's the, the size that you're interested in. And it's in reciprocal space. So the smaller the Q, uh, the bigger the object that we're looking at. So never try and reverse your car in Q, you will undoubtedly crash it. And the reason that we measure 2D patterns is, okay, normally we collapse down into 1D uh, plot, but sometimes samples are not isotropic, they can align. So I've shown you here three uh, aligned samples, well, two aligned samples, uh, which are basically uh, a drug that we were looking at that we were interested in measuring under shear, under different temperatures, because often drugs are injected and how you can inject them, they shear in the syringe and then it can actually have changes to the structure that you see uh, or we see, but that actually happens to the sample or the drug that you're injecting into people, which can change its properties. Uh, and then when we were measuring, if you injected it after it just come out of the fridge, so it was cold versus what it looked like at room temperature. And you can see that in the different systems, you actually do get different scattering patterns depending on the temperature and the shear rate that you're using. So that kind of information we can also get out of small angle scattering. So that's why we have the massive detectors. Sans, the SANS geometry itself, you can basically think as SANS as a pinhole camera, but for neutrons. So it's quite a simple uh, instrument. You have a, an A1, which is the first aperture of your instrument, which sort of defines the size of the beam coming into the instrument. And the distance from that A1 to the sample is called L1. So that's the first distance. And we try and match L1 to L2, where L2 is the distance from the sample to the detector to get the optimum resolution. Now, what happens is that the, the obviously a lot of the beam barrels straight through the sample and doesn't scatter. So on the detectors, we have to have something called a beam stop, which is this green thing here. And it's very, um, and it's, a, it's roughly the size of the beam that comes out of the sample that's not small angle scatter, so to speak. And we have to have those in place to protect the detector. That's the only reason it's really there. But also it's where the direct beam is splattering. So you couldn't really pull anything out of that information anyway, even if it went onto the detector, there's no small angle scattering there. So the, the lowest, uh, the biggest objects we can see are determined by the size of that beam stop because that's the, the smallest angle you can get to is the, the, the angle between the sample and the edge of that beam stop basically. So if you want to go to very low Q, uh, i.e. look at very big stuff with traditional SANS geometry such as this, the way you get that pin, that spot on the detector to be as small as possible is to push the detectors further away. So that's why we go to these long detector distances to get to low Q which sounds great in principle, apart from the fact that the more you push the detectors back, the more, uh, the lower the flux of the beam that comes to you. So it's always this balancing act between low Q and flux. And basically if you keep going, you'll have no neutrons left because the pinhole gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the detectors get further away, you have no scattering. So to try and get over this problem, the guys have developed something called with the, and this is a big collaboration with TU Delft in the Netherlands, a technique called spin echo sand. So this is llama labeling. So as I said at the start of the talk, neutrons have a magnetic moment. You can think of them as a tiny bar magnet. So what they do in spin echo sand is that they flip, and hopefully this will work, they flip all the neutrons to be aligned. So the, the um, little arrow on this diagram is a neutron. So if it goes through like this, they spin their neutron, they're all up, then it goes through a precession field. Then the green bit is where the sample would be. And then after the sample, you have an equal but opposite precession field. And so the neutron has ended up in exactly the same polarization state as it was at the start. So it's still facing up. Then if you have a sample in the way, the bottom thing happens. So you start to process your neutron, spinning away. It interacts with the sample. You then try and unwind it. But when you unwind it, the polarization is now not zero. And you can relate that polarization to basically a G of R, a real size. So it sounds very complicated and it is quite a complicated setup, but it basically allows you to probe larger length scales, but without having to have these very, very long beam lines. So then if you think about a SANS instrument as we had before, and then you stick the C SANS part of it on, you can basically have the shorter instrument, 
but then probe the low Q end of things without having to push to these very long, low flux instruments. So the advantages of spin echo sand is that it allows you to encode the beam with this sort of relaxed divergence that we talked about with no tight collimation. It has high count rates and it can probe really big length scales, so sort of 50 nanometers up to the micron length scale. So it's basically like dynamic light scattering length scales, but with neutron contrast. There are obviously disadvantages to this, otherwise we do it all the time. And those disadvantages are that the signal is superimposed on that direct beam that we're hiding on the SANS detector. So actually your sample has to scatter quite strongly to be able to distinguish it away from the direct beam. We have to have an analyzer in place to do these measurements and that obviously impacts on the angular coverage we can have on the detectors. And at the minute, SANS and CSANS cannot be run at the same time. So you have to do either one or the other. And people often want to measure the SANS and the spin echo SANS of their sample. So it can be a very long measurement time if you need to do both. The encoding currently is only in one direction. So I was telling you before about the, the, the coolness about having a 2D image. It allows you to see if there's anything uh, isotropic. So at the minute, we can only look at um, samples that are anisotropic or, or uniform in all directions. But the, the technique is available and it's used very heavily by the colloid community. So things that have food science is very popular because they have a lot of things on this sort of large and length scale. Polymer guys, bio guys, they're all very interested in it. But it, it's still a, a new technique for us, I would say. So just sort of give it an overview of what the size is and what we can look at. So obviously you have your crystallography on one end, which is classical diffraction. The microstructure is in the middle, which is where sand sits. So we tend to look at proteins, micelles, polymers, porous material, precipitates, etc. So sort of a few nanometers to hundreds of nanometers. And then sea sands really kicks in where we can start to look at yeah, viruses, some grain structures, that kind of thing. But that, that's the kind of overlap between the classical diffraction sands and spin echo sands. So we cover quite a broad range of ISIS. Um, and typically we look at bulk properties, so structure, size, polydispersity, uh, particle interaction, that kind of thing. So, as I say, science is pretty intense. We do a lot of different science. It's a, if you love science, it's a great place to work. If you hate science, it's rubbish. Uh, every day is totally different. I can be doing, you know, protein mixtures one day and then skirmions the next. It, it is a really exciting place to be uh, if you like doing lots of crazy experiments. Uh, anything you could think of, we've probably tried at least once with the sands being live. So just to give you an idea of not only the science, but the sample environment that we have available, we have a really broad range of stuff that you can do to your sample. So we can obviously look at things like magnetic nanoparticles. So using very large magnets, anything from a few, you know, half a tesla, probably even smaller, whatever that is, up to like, I think the biggest we've ever had is 14 tesla. So we have quite a range of magnetic fields. We obviously have sample changes, for kind of standard solution scattering. We can do grazing incidence measurements where we reflect off the surface, sort of do sands from a surface. We can do rheology, so looking at systems under shear, we can do that on the beam line. We have link cam, so if you want to cool your sample down and look at things like cryoprotectants, we can do that. Foam cells, if your sample's unstable, we can rock and rotate it to try and keep those large particles in the sample while we're doing the measurement. We can do kinetics, so we have looked at exchanging nano emulsions with stop flow. We can T-jump, so if you're interested in looking at complex polymer mixtures, we can T-jump it to look at those non-static uh, those non-static structures. Um, we've got a NERF setup, which basically allows us to do UV um, and fluorescence at the same time as the sands. Humidity chambers, if you want to heat your stuff up, we can put furnaces in. Um, we have CO2 pressure cells, 3D magnets, you name it, we probably try and do it. So it's an incredibly exciting place to be um, and just talk to us if there's anything that sort of you think, oh, yeah, quite fancy doing something or this would really apply to my area of science. Uh, we're happy to discuss it with you. So now I'm going to get onto some specific examples of not into a huge amount of detail because I kind of wanted to get a number into at least you get a flavor for the kind of information you can get out of uh, small angle scattering. So surfactants with CO2 is something that we've been doing at ISIS for a long time. Uh, it was initially kicked off by uh, the guys at the University of Bristol and UEA, so Julian Eastow and Dave Staitler, uh, looking at basically a yeah, surfactant assembly in supercritical CO2. So that's just a picture of some of the work we've done there. So why do we want to do it? So the idea behind this is that you can take CO2 from the atmosphere and compress it down into a supercritical fluid and use that as a solvent or uh, of interest for doing chemical processes in. So often in a chemical synthesis, you use volatile organic chemicals. And when you finish with it, you burn it off. And clearly that's not green or environmentally friendly. So here, the idea is you take the CO2 from the atmosphere, compress it down. So it's seen as green and clean. 
CO2 has a really accessible supercritical point. 73 bar, 31 degrees C, it's really easy to achieve. I mean, we all have a little pressure that does it quite simply. It's obviously non-flammable. There's plenty of CO2 about, it's recyclable. So the idea is you do your measurement under supercritical conditions, you let the pressure off, the, the product falls out and then you can reuse the CO2 afterwards. Uh, it's cheap, non-toxic. Um, but the big problem is, oh, and you can use it for things like enhanced oil recovery. The bad thing about CO2 is actually a really crap solvent. It's actually not very good at being a solvent. So the idea was that you would try and encapsulate, and that's particularly for polar solutes. So the idea here was that you would encapsulate water nanopores within the CO2, and then that would sort of increase um, the, the, the number of solutes you could dissolve in CO2, it would improve its sort of um, solvent properties. So that's the idea. So as you can imagine, the typical surfactants that you use in the lab don't work in CO2. So the group has spent a lot of time sort of designing bespoke uh, molecules that will sort of self-assemble into these structures and then not only self-assemble, but then allow you to encapsulate water uh, in the core of them. So it's absolutely hammering it down here at the minute, so I can just hear the rain coming down. So um, how do we do that? Well, as I said before, we have a, a bespoke pressure cell. Uh, we pressurize the CO2. We have a special injection system that allows us to pump in um, water and a surfactant. And what we do here is we use heavy water, we use D2O. There's a very clear scattering, um, there's a very clear signal from the D2O that we can see from the CO2. So it allows us to see if these nanopools of water is actually forming or not. So that's the kind of the image. That's what we have before. Then we add the surfactant, you get these nice nanodrops. And what that looks like from a scattering perspective on the raw detection measures, you get basically nothing. And then when you add the surfactant, you get some clear scattering around the beam stop. What we then do is then we can do the radial averaging and the first paper to come from Santa D was actually on some of these systems where we had designed a special tri-chain surfactant, it had three tails. And this was not only working in CO2 as shown here, it also worked in uh, water and in oil. So we basically designed a super designer surfactant that works in any of the conditions that we're interested in. And the image there is of me a long time ago because it's the first Santa D experiment and that's the sort of the special pressure cell that we use. So that pressure cell is actually, as you can imagine, solid steel, but the windows are sapphire. So they're C-axis cut sapphire and they're very chunky because they can go up to sort of a couple of kilobar, but they're actually totally transparent to neutrons because we pick sapphire. So again, it shows you, you can design these really complex pieces of sampling environments. But if you think about the neutron properties, as long as you design the windows out of the right material, the sampling environment becomes transparent and you're only scattering from the, from the sample that you're interested in. It's, it's really powerful. And then 36 more papers have followed. So we've done all sorts of tricks where we've changed the surfactant, we've changed the counter ions. It allows us to change the shape of those uh, micelles from sort of in the spherical ones that you saw to more elongated ones. That allows us to do things like playing tricks with the viscosity of the CO2, which can be handy when you're trying to enhance oil recovery or for storage. If you want to store the CO2, it needs to be thicker. We've done things where we've formed a melotype structures in it. So a whole range of different tricks we can now play. And that's all been, although we can see that the viscosity is changing, that, that the understanding that why it's happening is given by the neutrons. We can see the fact that these particles are elongating as we do stuff. So it's a really nice way of seeing what's going on in the sample. So another example I wanted to talk about was these low molecular weight um, gels or organogels. Uh, it's kind of a growing area of interest. And again, this has been work that's been supported by various universities, as you can see there. And generally, they are a molecularly a designed uh, molecule that we then has a 3D structure, it self assembles and it forms a gel. Uh, and we can use scattering alongside things like microscopy to really understand the structures and how they change in situ with different triggering conditions. So why are people interested in these? Well, they can be used for things like um, drug release. Uh, so you can have a, a liquid and then a gel or a gel and a liquid. So they're normally triggered. They can be light carriers. They're used for cleanup spills on, on, the, on the sea, for example, so oil spills. They're used a lot in the pharmaceutical and cosmetics industries uh, for scaffolding. They have a many a large uh, variety of applications in the industry uh, that they're used for. So how do they work? You normally take a, a solution of those molecules, uh, as I showed you earlier. There's a trigger, so that can be light-induced, temperature, pH, or even solvent switching. That then forms this self-assembling of non-covalent fibres and then eventually they've formed uh, entangled fibrous networks and you uh, have a supporting uh, gel. So the example I show you there is just where it was a light triggering one. 
we basically had the sample, we made a little mask for it with the word gel on it, we shone a light on it, and you can see clearly where the gel mask was. Some of it has gelled and some of it hasn't. Uh, and that's the scattering profile that you see uh, before and after gelling. So the, the white dots are just the normal, um, the molecules on their own. And then when we gel them, they form, form this network. And we can even see the node separation, which is that little bump that you see in the data. So we get quite a lot of information on the before and afters of these samples. So here's some results from a recent paper from the guys up at Glasgow, this is Dave Adams. So here they were playing tricks with this molecule called 2-NAP-FF, uh, and it has different stereo forms. So you've got LLDD and then LDDL, and they're shown there on the bottom right. And just changing that stereochemistry totally changes the scattering and well, the structures that are formed by those different uh, gels. And you look at it as a, as a gel and you were, some were soft, some were hard, and they couldn't quite work out what was happening there. So we did some microscopy and you can kind of see that all the fibers are formed, but it was really difficult to tell <clears throat> if they were truly different. And then when we did the scattering, you can clearly see that the, the, the gels, the, the fibers formed are very different from each other. So if you have the DD and the LL, you form these more worm-like sort of wrapping around each of the hollow tubes. If you have a mix, you get this polydispersity that's added in. DL and LDL, sorry, LD and DL also give these sort of long, thin wall tubes, but they tangle around each other less. And if you have a racemate, you basically get a mixture of structures, as, as you would imagine. So again, from the scaffolding, you get a very detailed picture of why these different types of gel are forming, and it helps people design better or tailored gels for the future. Excuse me. Just wanted to quickly talk about something called structural color. So this is something that happens quite a lot um, on the on the spin echo instrument because it's a larger length scale problem. Let's grab a drink of water. So here we're really interested in the micron length scale. And this here, I can't remember the name of this little white beetle, but basically he's one of the whitest beetles ever. So he's very, very white. And people are, such as Axe and Nobel, are interested in how this creature manages to become so white. And the reason that they're interested in him <clears throat> is because of things like paint. So at the minute, with paint, you will use things like titanium dioxide. Um, and clearly, that's not great to have lots of nanoparticles kicking about. The way that you make titanium dioxide is not very nice. It kicks off a lot of CO2, I believe. And just having a lot of nanoparticles around is not great for the environment. So rather than trying to induce colour chemically, can we not induce color structurally, which is what Mr. Beetle does. He does all his whiteness just by structure, not by chemistry. So if you can understand the structure of the beetle's shell, then hopefully you can make white paint that's based on structure rather than chemistry. So that's what the scientists at the University of Sheffield have been doing. They've been taking, I mean, these poor little beetles, they take, I'm sure they died of natural causes, but they take the, the, the bits of the outer bits of the beetle off and that's a, one of the little um, bits here on the right hand side. That's a, a, a beetle platelet on a, on a tip going into an X-ray beam line. So they've done a combination of the spin echo sounds, USACs, which is basically ultra small angle X-ray scattering, uh, reflectivity. They've done obviously uh, electron microscopy, SEM and TEM, as well as X-ray tom tomography, which is what that little thing they're going to spin around and have looked at it, which has then gained them a lot of structural information. So they've then been able to work out what molecules they need to make such a structure. And then hopefully that will lead to the design of new paints. And so what they've managed to do is that they've worked out from combining all these different measurements that these structures, <clears throat> first of all, they were able to work out what the structures are, so it's these spinodal type structures. And then actually how they were formed was by liquid-liquid separation. So they tracked that with the spin echo sands. And so now they've been able to make a synthetic porous white solos acetate film, which looks like Mr. Bug's uh, shell. And so they can now hopefully make white structural color paint. So it's been a really, a multi-technique way of looking at quite a complex problem and then actually developing something that could be used in the future. So Axon and were really pleased. So that was really good. Um, what time is it? Did you want me to wrap up soon or? Sorry, I think we do have still time, it's 12.40. Okay. So a few more examples then. So um, this is looking at over-based sulfonate engine oil additives. So we do a lot of work with the petrochemical industry trying to work out how to make their petrol less horrible, <laughs> shall we say. So this is looking at over-based um, engine oil. And this is working with uh, Cambridge University, but also Infinium and both Infinium and Lubrizol, uh, not together, of course, separately, but they're both interested in these, these additives. 
So these OBSAs are basically calcium carbonate nanoparticles stabilized by surfactants, um, and they are required to help with lubrication of the engine, to avoid knocking or this kind of thing. Uh, and their stability is crucial for their correct performance. If, they, if the surfactants come away and they collapse to the bottom of the, of the engine, they're no use to anybody. They know that they're affected by water at some level. And of course, the combustion process produces a lot of water. So what they're interested in is how does the combustion process affect the stability of these nanoparticles? So how do we do that? So they had an idea of what these particles look like. Um, so they're basically an amorphous calcium carbonate nanoparticle, which is about 10 nanometers. And they thought it was surrounded by this monolayer of surfactant which stabilized it. <coughs> But what they didn't know is when you have water, where does the water go and how does it actually destabilize the particles? So there were three possible locations. One was that they form water or micromulsions. Uh, one is that it's just somehow dispersed throughout the calcium carbonate particles. And the other one was that it could be on the surface of the particles. So we designed this experiment with different contrasts. So we did H surfactants with D oil, sometimes all H and then, and then a mixture of the two. And then we added D2O to some of them to, to work out exactly where the water goes. So that would be the I idealized picture. So that's where you can see everything. That's where you can just see the core. And if the water was to go on the outside, that's what it would look like. <clears throat> so then when we actually did the measurements, the water does go on the outside of the particle. So these are the SANS measurements. Um, we did lots of different contrasts, lots of different analysis. And basically we found out that the calcium particles were actually smaller than they thought. They're only about six nanometers, but there is this sort of surfactant stabilizing shell around the outside. And then when we added the water, the water does indeed form this very thin layer in between the particle itself and the surfactants. And the more water you add, the bigger that layer gets, the particles break down. That's why they were becoming unstable. So that was a really insightful piece of work. Um, I can also talk about ionic liquids, but I guess you've seen quite a lot of chemistry already. So maybe if I flip to the last example, I think, which was about alloys. So just to give you a flavor that we can do something other than soft matter. So we work quite closely with Rolls-Royce and the University of Cambridge and, and other, other engineering companies, of course, looking at alloys. Uh, and this was an example of a nickel-based uh, super alloy that's used in aero engine turbine discs. So why do people care about these things? And um, so the processes, so they have a lot of heat uh, cycle to these um, uh, turbine wing, uh, turbine blades to actually make, make them. And they were interested, the, the nickel alloys themselves, they have these exceptional mechanical properties. Uh, they're super corrosion resistant, which is great because you don't want your engine or your airplane wing falling off while you're flying in the sky. And they also work at really high temperatures. But what they want to be able to do is as they're doing these heat cycles to them, they want to be able to study how the structure of that alloy, alloy changes, but in situ. So they have lots of computer models that they have that they, they think why the, the different alloys break down at certain points, but they want to be able to validate that. And that's why they come and do neutron experiments. They don't bring every, every alloy ever. They bring a selection of them to, to test or validate the computer models that they have at the lab. So the results, so we could clearly see that these nickel alloys were composed of these different um, precipitates, which is really great. Uh, we did uh, lots of in-situ heating of the samples using a furnace to mimic these heat treatments that they do in the, in the manufacturing process. And then uh, they also did electron microscopy. We like to do uh, different measurements to really get a full picture of what's going on. And the SANS validated the computer models that they had been using. So it gave them really uh, improved understanding of what these different, uh, of these important alloys and, and how to develop them further. So just a quick thing about what is next. Uh, in the Sanskrit Hera Isis, people always want to get more out of their data. So we're kind of moving into this more atomistic and coarse grain modeling. It's, it's quite new for SANS uh, here at Isis at least, but it's something that we're trying to do more of. We're, we're developing more programs to help users get more information out of their scattering profiles. Um, we're looking at things like real-time reduction to try and speed things up. The measurements themselves are quite quick, but often what can happen is the data reduction analysis can take quite a lot of time. So we're trying to improve that pipeline, I guess, that goes from measurement to producing a paper or an improvement or whatever it is that somebody's interested in. People want to look at a broader range of sizes. So we're looking at trying to get wider angles on SANS 2D to go to the smaller length, uh, smaller length scales. We're looking at focusing optics on Zoom to get to the bigger ones. We're even proposing a new beamline, a U-SANS beamline that would also allow us to get to, to larger length scales. People always want more crazy sample environments. So we're working with the community um, to get uh, new uh, rheometers and, and all sorts of things that people want to do, flow cells, kinetics. People want to look at drying, levitation, 
it's all starting to come in now. So that, that end is being pushed a lot. In situ measurements are really becoming a thing. So people like to do light scattering or UV vis at the same time as they're doing their SANS measurements. So they can actually have a, a measurement that matches something they have in their lab. So they know the sample that they're measuring is exactly the same as the one they've measured in their lab. Uh, and in terms of sample design, people wanted to do more multi-component systems. So deuteration is having to sort of have to be thought about a little bit more because that's getting more complicated. People want more realistic samples. So, you know, really multi-component things where you don't have to do everything so sort of broken down. People want to make things that are smaller. Biology, for example, often don't have liters of the, of, the, of the sample. So we're trying to always go smaller and faster. So that's kind of where we are going, I think. Uh, and then all I wanted to say was, um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions. Thanks, Sarah, for a very nice presentation. Welcome. So it was, yeah, it was covering a wide range of applications in science, uh, biology, chemistry. Very interesting. So while we are waiting for, yeah, for questions, I have already one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was wondering the application of um, neutron scattering for uh, cluster analysis in tin films for, let's say, semiconductor applications. So the dimensions, limitations that you can, um, the neutron can, can cope with this problem. So you're interested in nanoparticles at a surface? Uh, the cluster size of, let's say, uh, atomic scale clusters. So within very thin films, let's say 20, 30 nanometer. So do you see any application here? So for determining the cluster size and probably the, the distribution? Yeah, so um, thin film samples are not, well, there's two ways of doing it. If you're interested in cluster size, and that's still a small angle experiment rather than a reflectivity one. So depending on what a thin film is, we can do it two ways. We can either stack several films together, which can help make the sample thicker, so to speak, assuming that it's uniform throughout the sample. Or we can do that trick I was saying about with the lying down of the sample and doing grazing instance geometry. So the, at the minute, that's quite, for, for ISIS, it's a fairly new technique. Um, and it's something that you can get um, cluster size out of, as long as the clusters are kind of on the few nanometers to maybe 50 nanometers. We've have looked up to 100 nanometers in size. Um, the difficult part of that is the analysis side of it. So if the samples aren't, if they're very, very disordered, it can be very difficult for us to see any sort of um, any information out of those peaks. It's quite difficult to probe it. But if this, so we had some guys that had these very well ordered nanoparticles that surface that clustered. So then we were clearly able to see like the 50 nanometer ripple from, from the sample. So it depends, yeah, the thinness of the sample isn't necessarily an issue. It's the ordering within that surface and the size of the clusters that you're interested in. So I would say yeah, anything from a couple to maybe 100 nanometers in size. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And the contrast, of course, but we can just yeah, we could always discuss the contrast. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It's really raining. So, uh, in case of any question, you can write in question and answer, and I suppose it can be also after the presentation if uh, Sarah is agree yeah. agree with it, so they can send it out. Sure. Did you want me to stop sharing or? Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Once again, thanks for the nice presentation. Okay. So I will now share my screen here. Sorry. Nope. So, yeah. Um, I would like to ask uh, all the audience to to complete the survey to for us to improve uh, our next uh, seminars, webinars, actually. So there will be a, a link in the chat so that we can uh, use it to, to fill the survey. And also for those uh, watching it through YouTube or replaying via YouTube, there will be the link in the description. Um, after this, I would like also to, to advertise our uh, next webinar. So this will be on 13th of June, again at the same time, 2 p.m. Central Europe time. Uh, the title of the next presentation will be Introduction on uh, introduction to Ion Beam Analysis by Dr. Johan Mirschaut from IMEC, Belgium. So uh, 
the complete list of um, seminars, webinars will be available in the Remit project website. So in case of any question, you can always contact us. Or if you have a question about today's uh, presentation, please forward it to me or either to, to Sara. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. So yeah, thank you all for your attention.